Uh, what I'll be talking about today is related to the ways how these difficult uh, and different memories can be mediated in post-conflict societies. I will be giving examples uh, mostly from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but actually I'll be giving you examples also from the other countries. Uh, before I start, uh, okay, this is one nice uh, quotation that I like to use at the very beginning. It is by Dimitrievich who said that uh, I'm chased by the spirits of innocent people that were killed in my name. That is probably the typical reaction to mass crime that had been experienced in the past from people that belong to the group identity of those that have committed uh, the mass crimes. Uh, I'll be telling you also about the ways how we can mediate these memories from the perspective of the group that is considered as perpetrator and from the perspective of the group that is considered as a victim. And that is also part of my ongoing research that I'll be doing as part of my PhD. Uh, okay, I won't have time enough to tell you all these things and all the theories, but I included them just because, uh, I don't know, I was listening, you know, presentations here from anthropologists and historians, and I realized that everyone is using uh, psychological terms or terms from psychology in different ways, so I just wanted to, you know, introduce the terms that we use in a way that we actually use it. <laughs> so I will tell you, yeah, with all the respect to all the other disciplines, but I'm biased. <laughs> Uh, so I will give you the overview, like first, like memory and cognition, what it means, what is memory in cognitive psychology, theoretical approaches to collective memory that we use, cognitive battles over memory, co conflict supporting narrative and how it is formed, and I will give certain examples from practice. Something that I will not briefly be explaining, but as we are using the term memory, it is just in cognitive psychology how it looks like, you know, this is how we memorize the things. We receive certain sensory input, uh, we have a sensory memory register, then if we are paying attention to that, that information will be stored in our shorter memory register where it can be held for a few seconds. And if we are repeating it, if we are rehearsing it, if we are planning to use it more, most probably it will be stored in a long-term memory where it can stay uh, for infinite period of time, as long as we need it and then as long as we are repeating it. This is a very influential atkinson schifrin model in cognitive psychology of memory. This is modification did by Badley Hitch, who said that actually uh, we are storing in a different way visual information, uh, information that are related to language and verbal memory, and also episodic, uh, episodic memory, which is related to all the memories from our um, everyday life, everything that was happening to us, what we had for breakfast yesterday, and so on. And according to Badley Hitch, we have one central executive that is actually uh, guiding all these registers in a way uh, to uh, memorize and consolidate different types of memories in our either long-term or short-term register. I'm done with this cognitive <laughs> psychology, so I apologize, but I had to start with that. Most probably this is the question that you have now in your mind. Why you just walk into this room? This is one of the most influential experiments in psychology, in history of psychology that most probably you are using and abusing very often, <laughs> and as all of us. Uh, what Ebbinghaus actually uh, concluded, I was very disappointed when I realized that actually this is the most influential experiment in history of psychology. It is actually that the more time, the more time has passed, the more we forget. So if I'm telling you this now, in 10 days, you will forget more than in five days. And that's the most influential, you know, <laughs> in the history of psychology when it comes to the memory. How do we come to this point that memory has a social component, not just a cognitive component? So I use this joke usually, you know, if you can't recall the name of a politician you would like to recall, let us help you. So uh, it is usually actually, uh, it started with Bartlett and the experiment, again, that all of you know, uh, when he actually gave, when it comes to the Bartlett, I will return to that slide. What he said, he gave one story to his participants, participants to read, and the story included details related to uh, Indians. At the end, the name of the story, War of the Ghosts, after a couple of days and a couple of months, when he asked them to retell the story, actually the details of the story were completely changed. But they were changed in line with their personal schema or schemata, their personal beliefs, expectations, and their cultural background. So what happened at the end? In the story, they have a word, kanu. At the end, it was, they were all talking about boat, even though boat was not even mentioned in that story. 
So that is what is happening with everything that we are memorizing. When we are retelling what we memorized, actually we are creating new memory each time and we are reconstructing. Regardless of whether it is traumatic memory or memory of what we read in the novel or memory of your memory of my presentation maybe now. <coughs> I will just return quickly to the slide that I... This is when it started with collective memories and how we came to the term of collective memories with Emil Birkham and his collective representations, now I'm borrowing. Uh, the set of beliefs and sentiments common to the average members of a single society which form a determinate system that has a life of its own. Later on, Morris Halbach slightly moderated his definition of collective representation and started using this term collective memory because he wanted to say that uh, they are actually memories that are commonly shared among the members of one society. When we are talking about this social aspect of remembrance, as a psychologist, we are usually referring to social identity theory, according to which our identity and our perception of our identity plays a huge role in how we will memorize and explain certain events from our past. For example, in this experiment McKeever did uh, to examine the memory of Northern Irish Catholics and Protestants for violent events that occurred since 1980s, he actually came to these conclusions that the Catholics were significantly more likely to remember Catholic deaths than the Protestants. <coughs> the Catholics were more likely to remember the Catholic events while there was no significant difference in relation to the recall of the seven Protestant events. And Catholics attributed blame to external factors such as the government, while Protestants tended to attribute this event to internal factors such as suicide. Also, uh, commemorations and other social rituals that exist in certain society are shaping the way how we will remember and memorize certain events. So, I won't be explaining this deeply because I'm sure that most of you are quite familiar with the ways how we commemorate. This was uh, one of the commemorations devoted, actually, to uh, 11,541 child killed during the siege of Sarajevo. Uh, you know, uh, the same number of red chairs was placed through the main street of Sarajevo and uh, people were not allowed to sit on these chairs but they were allowed to bring toys or any other, you know, uh, uh, belongings of, the, of children in order to show the respect and tribute to their dead. Uh, there are a lot of controversi controversies also about this event, among those, some of them were that chairs were brought from Serbia and then, that, and from the other side, that actually, it, there was no 11,000 children, but there was less. These are happening from different sides. Excuse me, was it children? Yeah. No, no, it was children. children. It was all with children. All with children. All with children. All with children. All with children also included, but yeah, this yeah, was mostly for children, children, actually. Also, I think you will, majority of you will visit Potocari, so I won't be talking a lot. You will see how it looks like much better, but just to tell that even though it is commemorated, even though it is very traumatic, there are still a lot of controversies at the end. It usually, it sometimes even ends up in more ethnic conflict than actually commemoration and tribute to victims who were killed there. And, uh, okay. Uh, Kazani, I don't know how well familiar you are with this case, that the members of uh, one battalion of uh, Bosnian army actually took some Serbs from Sarajevo and killed them on the mountain Trebevic. Uh, right now, Serbs are actually, and citizens of Sarajevo, most of them, want to commemorate actually this event as a tribute to victims who were killed during the siege of Sarajevo and who were not Bosnians but Serbs, but killed because of the different name and so on. I'm exploring this case also more in my research. And also, besides, uh, when it comes to the identity, the second theory that we are referring is, uh, to is identity process theory, focused upon the identities of groups rather than individuals. Uh, and uh, it's actually arguing that this social remembering might heighten the sense of continuity across time, distinctiveness, collective esteem, collective efficacy, and cohesion of group. Because in the majority of cases, all of these rituals, commemorations are used in order to promote group cohesion, and sometimes they are abused by politicians in order to promote uh, such. How do we come to this collective narrative? Pender Bakker was among the first who actually introduced the term collective, the ways how collective memories were actually introduced as collective narratives, and uh, which is like consensual story about particular event or person from the past. I will just try to speed up. 
Uh, when we are talking, no, no, speed up through the slides because the other participants won't have enough time. Uh, when we are talking about um, memory and forgetting, what do we memorize from the society? What we take as our memories, our narrative, what we forget? Uh, according to social psychology, it is part of social convention. Usually in one society, you know, it is proposed what should be forgotten, what should be remembered. And now we have, like, I don't know whether you read David Reeves' book Against Remembrance, in which he is proposing how remembrance can be bad, actually, in that sense, for society and for reconciliation and for mediation of difficult memories. Because we are creating different, especially in Bosnia, we have different narratives and we have clash of these different narratives. In order to create these narratives, in order to create these completely different, you know, uh, narratives and communities of memory, we have these two, three groups that are very, very influential. Family, ethnic group, and the nation. So I won't interfere into details. I think it's very clear how the family interferes, then the ethnic group to which that person belongs, and at the end, the whole nation, in that sense. And also the institutions of memory that are here helping us to create the memories, like schools, and especially textbooks, courts, museums, and mass media. Uh, I did one research on uh, um, differences in historical textbooks that were currently used here uh, in the academic 2013-2014. If you want, I can show you the results very briefly, if you are interested. I have to We act, uh, you know that we have here, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have to adhere to these guidelines for history textbook writing because we don't have one common narrative. So we, since we have three different textbooks that are used in three different parts of Bosnia, one in federal part, the other one in the Republic of Srpska, and one in uh, areas that work according to Croatian curriculum, which is parts of Herzegovina and so on. So what I was interested in, since according to these guidelines, it is not allowed to talk about 1992-1995 war. So I was interested in actually, actually whether they are really adhering to these guidelines, and whether this war is actually mentioned in any sense. Uh, so I realized that actually this is uh, the textbook for fourth grade, because in other textbooks they don't even talk about Yugoslavia and these things, they have completely different topics. So I was actually trying to find the frequencies of mentioning of several events that were of my importance for the research. The solution of Yugoslavia, war in Bosnia, listed, uh, listed only as uh, the starting day of the war. So whether they even mentioned the starting day, uh, then war in, sorry, this is very hard to show, war described whole war, then war in Croatia, NATO bombardment of Serbia. What we realized actually, Later on, I did it in, in uh, cooperation with my colleague from Serbia, so we also added analysis for the textbooks used in Serbia and Montenegro, because they have only one. One in Serbia, one in Montenegro. So what we realized that actually, in federal textbook, if we can use it that way, for the solution of Yugoslavia, you can see, it was written four times, the Republic of Srpska, like two times, in Croatian curriculum, six times. War in Bosnia was mentioned, even though it is, beginning of the war was mentioned, even though it's forbidden, one time in a federal textbook, zero time in the Republic of Srpska, but in a textbook that works according to Croatian curriculum, the whole war was described completely. But they usually started uh, with the explanation of war in Croatia, and then later on they mentioned war in Bosnia, as war in Bosnia was, as, as Bosnia is mentioned like a second country. You know, Croatia was first mentioned like a first, and, and then Bosnia as a whole country. The whole war, yeah, only in Croatian textbook. When it comes to this war to, in Croatia, it was mentioned only in this Croatian textbook. No one else was talking about it. And NATO bombardment of Serbia was not mentioned in any of these textbooks. However, even though we said that they had the agreement not to talk about war, if you read the preface of this federal textbook, you could find these words. Uh, this textbook deals with the world, European, and so on, but the last the sentence, it is particularly important to know that in this period, an independent state of Bosnia was established after a long and terrible war which was led against it by all means. So in preface, it is written, actually. And this is what is written in uh, uh, this textbook used in Republic of Srpska. You can be informed of the events of our nearest past after 1991 on the basis of interviews with contemporaries, teachers, parents, participants in events, as well as from other sources, newspapers, documents, photographs, documentaries. Information can be discussed during history class and tutorials. Okay. 
I also did the analysis of the differences in the presentation of 14 uh, Congress of, uh, I will tell you here. This is how much time. I did this analysis for those of you who are historians and who might be interested in the presentation of um, 14 Congress of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia and differences of the presentation of this Congress in three textbooks. I can show you that also later on because it will be too much of time here. And for the last one, this is the frequencies of mentioning of Bosnia, Serbia, and Croatia uh, within the topic of dissolution of Yugoslavia. So since they are not talking about war, they talk about dissolution of Yugoslavia. So I wanted to see how many times they actually mentioned the countries, these countries, when they were talking about that process. So as you could see, in uh, federal textbooks, 18 times Bosnia was mentioned. In Republic of Srpska, zero. They, not, they don't even talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina when they are talking about the dissolution of Yugoslavia. In this Croatia, 16 times. In Serbia, 13. In Montenegro, 7. Serbia was mentioned five times in federal, six in the Republic of Srpska, 15 in Croatian, in Serbia, 13, and so on. Croatia, you could see it was re mentioned eight times in federal textbooks, but 34 times in this textbook that works according to Croatian curriculum. I, at the same time, they mentioned Bosnia only 16 times. So, okay, I will move to my presentation just to. Yeah. I will just wrap. So, my presentation actually, how do I. How I came to this. Yeah, how I came to this um, mediation of difficult memories model that I'm proposing actually here. I started with eight teams of master narrative created by Bartal. Actually, uh, in which it always, it always good justification uh, involvement in the conflict, delineates the danger. This is what perpetrators are doing usually. Delegatismization of glorification, the image of my group, victimization, patriotism, maintaining unity, peace. In one of my researches that I done on uh, remembrance of Turkish-Armenian conflict, actually when I interviewed 100 uh, young Turks and asked them actually about what happened there, how would you retell it to someone who never heard of it, what, what, why this happened. And when I tried to analyze this according to these themes, actually uh, I can show you later on or I can send you uh, the frequencies uh, that actually in majority of cases they were justifying the way how they behaved uh, because they said that Armenians were threat. And in all cases, they were talking that they were attacked and they're just defending their land. Okay, so the second thing that I'm using is seven sins of memory provided by Schachter, but I'm actually mostly concerned by bias in memories. Because in my research, I'm analyzing bias in memories to four war events related to uh, events in which according to media and according to what we know, Bosniaks were victims, while Serbs were perpetrators, while in to the other Bosniaks were perpetrators, Serbs were victims. So I'm trying to see whether there are some uh, bias in memories and how it uh, actually... Um, in, yeah, it's not visible, but I can send you this. I have it also in Word, but it's just not working. What we are doing, we have individ individual with its core and narrative memory, according to Kraft. Uh, core narrative is everything that we remembered through all these schemas that I was trying to explain, you know. Memory in its sense, with the feelings, with the taste, with the smell, with everything. That memory is narrated through the narrative memory. That is how we actually respond when someone asks us, what do you remember of it? How do you talk, talk about it? So each individual is going through society, through its core and narrative memory. Then meeting actually, is when that individual is in front of the conflict or is uh, forced to be in a situation in which they talk about conflict, in which her identity threat and group belongingness is somehow uh, victimized and she or he feels that her identity is what is important group belonging i can explain you that later on then it is better but actually model is based on Schachter and Bartal and i'm trying to see how individual memory should be mediated and how we can understand how individual memory should be uh, analyzed through these models in order to understand how individual becomes collective and then why collective why both individuals coming from two biased memories are actually in clash and where we should uh,